Good morning, everybody. It is a joy to be with you today, and I hope that your fall season is going well. We are now officially into fall, even though we've been jumping into the fall season here the last couple of weeks here at First Church. Uh, we now on the calendar are officially into fall as well. So I hope that your fall is off to a great, great start. Uh, again, I want to welcome you today, and especially if you're newer with us, uh, if you could do us a favor, we would be really grateful. We'd love to connect with you. And one of the best of the ways that we can do that is through the connection card opportunity that we offer. So if you look on the upper right-hand portion of your screen, uh, you'll see there an opportunity to fill out a connection card. So if you take a few moments and do that, that would be great mainly because we wanna know you. Uh, we wanna be in relationship with you. So if you take a few moments, that would be awesome. For those of you who have been journeying with us the last number of weeks, you will also know we, as we've jumped into the fall, have been exploring the book of Romans together as a church. And specifically, we've been talking about what does it mean to explore a masterpiece? Because when Paul shares the book of Romans with us, that's what he's doing. He's sharing a masterpiece in terms of the summary and presentation of the gospel. And so there's a lot of things that we're doing with that. Lots of you have already been going through this devotional booklet. And if you still haven't had a chance to pick that up, it's not too late. Uh, go ahead and grab that as different individuals in our church have put that booklet together. But another opportunity that we have that we're really excited about is we are creating a weekly podcast that goes in conjunction with the sermon and the study of each week. Episodes are released each week, and in those episodes, Pastor Janet and Mitch have conversation around the scripture that we're diving into together. So we invite you to find the link on our website or directly on our church app and join us as one more way, one more supplement and complement to the rest of the work and the rest of the focus we're doing on this Roman study. It's been so fun to hear from a lot of you different ways that you're engaging in this study and the difference that that is making. So we hope that applies to you as well. Today, as we get ready to worship, uh, we wanna be intentional to center ourselves, uh, to set aside other distractions and really give all of our focus to God as we get ready to dive into God's word with one another and in this time of worship. So as we get ready to share with our children in a children's moment, would you join with me as we enter into that time together? Hi friends, Miss Courtney here. And did you know that yesterday was the first day of fall? You may have noticed that the leaves are starting to change color, starting to get a little colder, and that it's starting to get darker a little bit earlier. Well, the other day I came across a great devotional that I wanted to share with you about the seasons and then something in our lives that never change. Spring and summer, fall and winter. You know what the seasons are, but have you ever wondered why we have them? It's because the earth doesn't sit straight up and down in space. It tilts or leans a little, 23.5 degrees to be exact. So as the earth makes its 365 day trip around the sun, the amount of sunlight that falls on each part of the earth changes a little bit each day. The places that get more sunlight have summer and spring, while the places that get less sunlight have fall and winter. Because the earth is always moving, the seasons are always changing. When it's freezing cold during the winter, you can know the summer sunshine is on its way. In fact, it's already happening somewhere on earth. The seasons aren't the only things that constantly change. In fact, just about everything on earth is changing. Families change, schools and jobs change, friends change, even you change. Sometimes it can be hard to know what you can count on because everything seems to be changing. But remember this, God never changes. Nope, not ever. He's the same today as he was yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow too. So when he says he loves you, and he'll always be there for you, you know it's true. Spring or summer, fall or winter, seasons come and go, but God always stays the same. Will you pray with me? Lord, no matter what season I'm in, whether it's sunny or sad or somewhere in between, I know that you have a purpose for it. Help me to trust you. 
In your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week and enjoy this fall weather. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with nowhere to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your endless love Chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my death and he called me his friend. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free watches over. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. I see you displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever. And my life began when death was arrested, and my life began. We thank our worship team for leading us in those moments together. As we continue in a spirit of worship today, would you join with me now in a time of prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, we are a people who value freedom. Uh, we value the freedom to make our own choices, 
We value the freedom to do the things that we want to do. And yet, God, we oftentimes have a sense of freedom that's not accurate. We pray today, God, that you'll begin to show us the meaning of true freedom, to understand that as followers of Jesus Christ, that true freedom is found in being set free from the power of sin, that true freedom is being set forth in the power of new life found in you. And so we pray today, God, that as we dive into your word, that we would experience the unique freedom that only you can give. God, we live in a time when we are uh, just constantly given challenges uh, to our faith and to our everyday circumstances. We live in a time, God, where it's easy to feel so many pressures that it can feel difficult to move forward. So today, God, we pray for a fresh sense of your freedom, a fresh sense of your power, a fresh sense of reality of life in and through your son, Jesus. God, we pray this as individuals and we pray it together as a church. We continue to pray, God, that we would be a people who experience and share transformation in and through your son, Jesus, through humble power, through beautiful diversity, and through rugged discipleship. God, we know that our world is hurting. Particularly today, God, we pray for those affected by flooding. We pray for those affected by earthquakes. We pray for those affected by violence and injustice. And we pray, God, for those on our own hearts that we know today are hurting in some way. Specifically, God, individuals in our own lives who need your healing touch, who need reminders of your presence in their life. Lord, we lift these people and these situations to you here today. God, as we gather this day, may we once again encounter you in a real and holy and powerful way. We pray, God, that you will help us to walk day in and day out with you. And we pray, God, for a move of your Holy Spirit that grows us in you and once again, Lord, sets us free in you, in your love, to share with our world. We pray this today in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus together. Amen. When we come together in worship, there are many things that we can do to engage with one another and engage with God. We pray together, we sing together, we listen and dive into God's word together, but we also give together. And so I wanna invite us today as an intentional act of worship to give our offering unto God. And each time that we give, it's not just something that we do that helps strengthen our faith in God, it is also something that makes a difference in the life of the body of Christ. And so every time that you give, it makes a difference in the lives of others. Specifically this week, as you are giving, know that your giving impacts our Acts network. One of the things that I absolutely love at First Church is that this is a church willing not only to just gather on its own turf for worship, but it's committed to reaching out to people who on their own will never come to us. And so the Acts network is really designed to meet people on their turf to build relationships with them there, and ultimately to connect in worship and to connect in the love of God right where they are. And so sometimes that takes place in nursing homes, uh, that can take place on a rugby field, that can take place at a gym, that can take place in a home, all kinds of other places. Thank you for being a church committed uh, to that kind of ministry focus. Thank you for being a church willing to do whatever it takes to reach out and connect with people where they are so that they can experience the love and the freedom in Jesus Christ. Let us give this day in a spirit of generosity and joy, knowing that your gift makes a difference. And as you give this day, I invite you now to go ahead and watch this video, which shows us just a portion of the impact your giving can make. I would describe the Axe Network as a series of communities of individuals that are gathering around a shared interest and a desire to apprentice under Jesus. There are five stages to developing and maintaining an Axe Network group. So the first one is listening. That's a huge part of what it looks like to just be able to understand the grievances and the anticipated joys of the community that you want to serve. Then there's loving and serving. And as we love and serve, we hope to see community to form. 
Then we explore discipleship as we build trust with that community. And finally, church begins to form. So there's a variety of ways that you can go about it, but it's less of a line than it is a cycle. So one of the things that we get to explore as we not only begin an X Network group, but continue to foster um, growth is figuring out how can we best identify which of these needs attention and which of these that we're doing really well. I truly believe that Axe Network groups have a remarkable chance of having transformation in Christ. People that have been away from church for a long time are being exposed to Jesus again. And it's through being in Jesus' presence and reflecting on all of the work he has done in our lives and in the lives that have come before us that people begin to experience that transformation where they learn to have gratitude for God and all of the work he's done in their life and they learn to look for him again. The other thing I would say that's really stuck out to me is not only do people start to open up their hearts to God, but they also learn to open up their hearts to other believers and other people that are exploring this faith. We really believe that as the established church, we have the opportunity to create spaces that hold the DNA of what church is, where our attention is on Jesus and we are learning to grow toward him together. But just doing it in a unique space that doesn't leave people feeling like it's a part of a community they don't want to be in. So we really believe the Axe Network is going to be part of the future of the church. How we can help those individuals that are afraid of being a part of something that has a pew connect with a Jesus community.
Well, the scripture upon which we'll be focusing this morning can be found in Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. I'm going to read these words from the New International Reader's Version. So I invite you to hear God's word. What should we say then? Should we sin because we are not ruled by the law, but by God's grace? Not at all. Don't you know that when you give yourselves to obey someone, you become that person's slave? And if you are slaves of sin, then you will die. But if you are slaves who obey God, then you will live a godly life. You used to be slaves of sin, but thank God that with your whole heart you obeyed the teachings you were given. You have been set free from sin. You have become slaves to right living. Because you are human, you find this hard to understand. So I am using an everyday example to help you understand. You used to give yourselves to be slaves to unclean living. You were becoming more and more evil. Now give yourselves to be slaves to right living. Then you will become holy. Once you were slaves of sin, at that time right living did not control you, what benefit did you gain from doing the things you are now ashamed of? Those things lead to death. And you have been set free from sin. God has made you his slaves. The benefit you gain leads to holy living, and the end result is eternal life. When you sin, the pay you get is death. But God gives you the gift of eternal life. That's because of what Christ Jesus our Lord has done. Will you join with me in prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for the good news of the gospel in your word. And God, we pray that your word would transform our lives that you would help us to understand. And even more than that, that you would help us to live into this word, to embody it in such a way that gives you honor and glory and allows us to live in true freedom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, when you think about your life, what was the worst job you ever had? Summer jobs were hard to come by when I was in high school and college. And so at that time, if you were offered a job, you basically took it. You couldn't be too picky about the kinds of jobs that you would take. And so when I think about the worst job that I ever had, I have a lot to choose from. Uh, there are several options for my worst job ever. There was flipping hamburgers and pouring beer at Cateros Amusement Park. It was gross. I'm not even gonna tell you about it except to say that the first thing I always did when I got home was take a shower. There was another job where I put tickets on clothing at a local warehouse. Click, 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 all day long. It was boring. But the one that I remember the most clearly was working for the Little Sisters of the Poor at Our Lady of Hope Nursing Center. And my job was to clean bathrooms. Every day I put on my uniform of powder blue khakis and pinstriped blue and white seersucker shirt, and I went to work for the nuns. My boss was Sister Gertrude, and I mostly liked her. I say mostly because I was a little afraid of Sister Gertrude. And one of the reasons that I was a little afraid of Sister Gertrude was because her standards of cleanliness were unlike anything I had ever experienced. Sister Gertrude had me clean bathrooms that to me appeared to be spotless. When I would clean the tile in the bathroom, she had me use a toothbrush to scrub the grout. And she warned me that I made need to make sure that I would clean and dust above the door frame because she would be checking on that when she looked at the bathroom after I had cleaned it. I was grateful for the job, but I was also really grateful when the end of the summer came and I got my last paycheck and I could go back to school. I worked at Our Lady of Hope a long time ago and a whole lot has changed since then. I no longer have 
those powder blue khakis and sear sucker sear shucker shirt. Ah, it's hard to say, uh, and it wouldn't fit me even if I did. Um, I know I can't imagine. I no longer live in upstate New York, and so it would be ridiculous for me to drive over four hours to go to work at a place where my job was to clean bathrooms. Uh, I don't want to even think about going back to that job, scrubbing grout with a toothbrush. I have a very different life now. As we look at Romans 6 today, I think that is Paul's big point. Paul wants the Christians in Rome to know that the good news is impacting them. And as followers of Jesus Christ, they have a new life. And it makes no sense to go back to the old way they used to live. There's no reason to want to do that. There's no reason they should do that. There's no reason they have to do that. Because they have received the gift of God that is eternal life in Christ. And that changes everything. It's good news. I hope it sounds good to you. I hope it sounds good to you to hear that we can live a life of true freedom that allows you to be all that God desires for you to be. But I want to also be honest because I don't think we always believe what Paul is saying in these verses. So if you look at verse 18, in, uh, in verse 18, Paul says, um, You have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. What does slavery to righteousness or to right living mean to you? Does it sound like an invitation? Because let's be honest, many people, we don't want to be a slave. We want to be free right? We look forward to vacation so that our schedule will become our own um, and we can do what we want with the days. Or even better, we look forward to retirement when never again we have to punch a clock or do what the boss says. Freedom. We don't like the idea of being controlled by someone or something else. What is the scene in Braveheart that everyone always talks about? It's that one word cry from William Wallace, freedom. It's a rallying cry and it makes our hearts stir a little bit. They pump a little bit faster because we all want to live in freedom and we all feel enslaved to something enslaved to the pressure to perform, enslaved to the worries that just never seem to stop, enslaved to health problems that limit our activity, enslaved to the past that continues to haunt us. And deep in our bones, we just want freedom, not slavery. I think that's especially true for us as Americans because we live in the land of the free, right? And the last war that was fought on our soil was a war over slavery, a bitter war that devastated communities and families. The slavery that existed in our country was shameful. And the wounds that we still have because we captured, deported, and enslaved African people and then cruelly mistreated them should make slavery a dirty word for us. But Paul says, we are to become slaves to right living. And he uses that phrase twice in this passage, both in verses 18 and in verse 19. And you can tell Paul isn't completely happy and satisfied with this term because he says in verse 19 that he's describing this for us like this because we're human and we need some everyday examples in, to, in order to be able to understand these complex concepts that he's trying to communicate. And for the Romans, slavery was an everyday example. They would completely understand that because slavery was ubiquitous in Rome. In fact, there were so many slaves in Rome that the government had a proposal that slaves would have to wear different clothing than free people. And they rejected that proposal because they felt that it would be too dangerous for the slaves to realize just how many of them there were. But despite their number, slaves knew their place. And being a slave was a defining mark of a person's identity. Being a slave 
was more significant than a person's gender. A free female would have higher status than a slave male. It was more significant than a person's age. A free son would have higher status than a slave father. It was more significant than a person's occupation or wealth because slaves were doctors and architects and teachers and poets, and some were even wealthy. And yet none of that mattered because slaves occupied the lowest rung on the social ladder. And in a society that very much valued status, slaves were the lowest of the low and they knew it. It was possible for a slave to be freed. It was very difficult, but it was possible. And some slaves were able to secure and to purchase their freedom. But even when they did that, they still carried the stigma of slavery. They were then known as a freed slave. Higher status, but still not completely free because slave remained part of their identity. I wanna keep that context in mind as we dig into what Paul writes about slavery. So going back to chapter five, uh, Paul explains how we humans came under the power of sin. And that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three, when Adam chose to disobey God and consequently sin and death were unleashed into God's good creation. We tend to uh, define and think about sin as doing the wrong thing. We see it as a transgression, that sin is breaking God's rules. And sometimes when Paul uses the word sin, that's what he means. For example, if you look in verse 15, uh, Paul says, should we sin because we are ruled, not ruled by the law, but by God's grace? Paul is asking that question. He's asking, should we sin? Should we intentionally do what we know is wrong because we are covered by God's grace? But more frequently than referring to sin as a transgression, Paul is using the word sin in a different way. Paul uses the word sin to describe an evil cosmic force. Look at verse 16. Paul asks, don't you know that when you give yourselves to obey someone, you become that person's slave? If you are slaves of sin, you will die. In that verse, Paul says that sin is a master of slaves, that sin can be someone you obey, a power that works in opposition to God and ensnares humans. Sin is not just breaking a rule. Sin is an enslaving power that takes control of human beings. And that even when we try to do the right thing, we can't do it consistently. Even when we love God and want to be obedient to God, we fail because we humans have been enslaved by sin. We don't do the wrong thing simply because we are undisciplined or we are weak. It's because there is a power greater than us that has grabbed hold of us and corrupted us. And it is such a powerful force that we are going to see in chapter seven that it has even seized the opportunity to twist God's holy law so that the law, which was given to bring life, actually brings death to God's people. Now, no one in their right mind would ever want to be enslaved by the power of sin. No one in their right mind would ever choose slavery to sin that leads to death. I think our temptation isn't to choose slavery to sin. Our temptation is to want to be our own master. Why can't we just be free? Why do I have to be a slave to anything? Being a slave to right living doesn't sound like much fun. And if you're wondering, why can't I just follow my heart, do what works for me, find my own way? If that's what you're thinking, you're failing to realize 
what we are up against. Sin is a powerful cosmic force that grabs hold of us and enslaves us and seeks to destroy us. Now, if you're like, jeepers, she's being a little dramatic today. I don't think it's quite that bad. One of the ways that sin works is by convincing us that it isn't quite that bad. Isn't that how an addiction starts? Often sin doesn't begin by looking so bad, but if it isn't dealt with, it grows and it destroys us, just like an addiction. Not too long ago, there was a news story about an alligator that was seen in a, the Kiskey River in Western Pennsylvania. Now, how does an alligator get to Pennsylvania? I bet you could guess. The alligator that was seen, they thought, was about uh, four foot long, which would make it about an adolescent alligator. And so authorities suspect that what happened is that someone went down to Florida or the South and found a baby alligator that didn't look quite that bad. And then that baby alligator grew and it started to become apparent what its true nature was. It's not harmless. Alligators are dangerous, and it's not wise to keep one around. And the same is true about sin. It's not harmless. It doesn't matter how tough we are. It will enslave us. If it can't get you to do the wrong thing, it will make all of your efforts to do the right thing, and it will twist them. If sin can't get you to do the wrong thing, sin will make you self-righteous about doing the right thing. If, if sin can't get you to do the wrong thing, it will plague you with anxiety about the possibility of messing up. It will make you a slave. Beverly Gaventa has written, sin cannot be avoided or passed over. It can only be served or defeated. And the good news that Paul wanted the Romans to know and that we too are invited to hear is that if that sin has been defeated by Jesus' death on the cross and that if you become obedient from the heart to the teachings of Jesus Christ and are a slave of righteousness, you are set free from sin. This is the most important part of the message today. Everything I've said so far is to prepare us to pay attention to this part, to understand what it means. Let's first clarify what it doesn't mean. To be set free from sin doesn't mean that we are no longer going to struggle with sinful desires and that we are no longer going to do the wrong thing. The defeat of sin was assured by the resurrection of Jesus, but the power of sin is still present in our world. If that seems like hard to understand, let me use an example and it relates to slavery. Slavery in the United States. When did slavery in the United States end? That may seem like a simple question, but it's a lot harder than it first might seem. You could answer, well, slavery ended on January 1st, 1863 when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and liberated three million slaves. Or you could say, well, it was actually two and a half years later on June 19th, 1865, when Union soldiers rode into Texas and liberated 250,000 people who were still living in slavery in our country. Or maybe, it really wasn't until December 18th, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was signed. Slavery was present in our country long after freedom was guaranteed to African Americans by our government. And the same is true about sin. Freedom from sin has been guaranteed by Jesus Christ and sin is still present in our world. And to become a slave, uh, a, a slave of righteousness, the other thing that it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that we can't have any fun. <laughs> be honest, some of you might be worried about that. Like, what freedoms do I have to give up if I'm going to be like a holy person, a slave of right living? Paul explained freedom 
by giving the example of slavery because the Romans were familiar with slavery. But that's not an example that works especially well for us because slavery is, thank God, no longer part of our culture. And so it might help to explain this with a few other examples that do relate to our culture. So mostly people listening probably have a driver's license. And if you have a driver's license, you have the freedom to operate a vehicle on public roads. And that freedom makes it possible for you to go so many places. You can drive to work, you can drive to a restaurant, you can drive for days if you want, you can drive all the way to California. But you aren't free to drive however you want. Even if you are in a hurry, you have to stop at a red light. And you cannot drive the wrong way on a highway, even if you want to and you feel like it. You cannot ignore the rules of the road because if you did, it would make it very dangerous and very difficult for anyone to go anywhere. And you wouldn't really be free. And so the rules of the road actually grant you more freedom so that you can drive places and go places, which is the whole purpose of having a driver's license. Another example is marriage. I've been married to Ken for 34 years. In all of those years, 34 years, I have never gone on a date or had a, a romantic relationship with anyone except for my husband. Probably when you hear that, you are not thinking, oh, poor Janet. She has so, she's so limited. She can't have any fun. She only has this one guy. Marriage has really curtailed her freedom. I hope you're not thinking that. And when Ken and I decided to get married, it didn't even enter our minds that we should get married so that we could save on rent, file a joint tax return, share household tasks. We didn't get married for practical reasons. We also didn't get married because somebody said, you two should get married. <laughs> Why do people get married? There's really one good reason to get married. It's because you are in love, because you believe that you have found a relationship that will not limit your freedom, but will allow it to flourish. A relationship that will provide you with stability. Someone who isn't just there on days when you're at your best, but somebody who sticks with you when you're at your worst, when you fail, when you need help, Someone who grows with you, someone who grieves with you, and who knows you. Someone who loves you unconditionally and allows you to be free to be who you really are. That's true freedom. The Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ because more perfectly than any spouse ever could, Jesus offers you freedom that will allow you to truly flourish. Not to do anything you want, but to live in a way that allows you to become your best self. We no longer need to be controlled by the power of sin. Jesus offers true freedom, not by following a set of rules and limitations and being good, not by saying a specific prayer or praying in a particular way, but through the power that God gives us that sets us free from sin and changes us, a power that gives us a new heart as a gift when we turn away from sin and turn to Jesus. How does that happen? J.D. Greer says, listen, this is not some kind of mental trick where you tell yourself I'm brave enough times that you become brave. No, God actually gives you the power when you believe that what God says is true. When you say, I do, I do believe in my heart, not just in my head, but in my heart, that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't control it, we receive it. And it's a gift 
that allows us to live lives of true freedom. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you so that you may live in true freedom. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for worship today. If you're new here and would like to connect with us, be sure to check out the First Church website or app, our weekly newsletter, and our Facebook and our Instagram. We're really grateful that you've spent part of your morning with us, and we hope that you have a great week.